Yes, um, Jen's not here tonight because her grandmother is slowly passing away. She asked that we pray that God will take her quickly so she doesn't have to suffer. Uh, so they're expecting her to go sometime tonight, I guess. So she wants to be close by. She's in Somerset, so she wants to just um, let you know that we're praying uh, for that. Let's just pray that right now. Father, we just lift up Jen's grandmother to you. Lord, we pray for your mercy to be extended to her, Father. We pray, God, that you would just remove the breath of life from her and enter as she enters into your arms, Father, and she enters into heaven. Father, she does know you. She's born again, and so thank you for that. And, God, we just pray, Father, for your peace to be upon the family and comfort to be with the family at this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Uh, before I get into God's word, I just want to share a little bit of my day today. I was out executing a uh, eviction notice uh, with uh, Trent, and um, to be and see the th conditions that I saw woke me up to a few things in New Bedford. And he said, "This is nothing what you saw. Uh, there were needles, there was drugs and spoons on the floor." The apartment was a mess. Uh, the, we opened the bathroom door. We almost puked. Um, they're going to the bathroom in the, in the tub and leaving it there. Uh, it was horrible. And to think that there are people living in that condition um, and would still be there if there was not an execution for eviction uh, and still continue being in that environment uh, blows my mind. Just blows my mind because we're all in a little bubble, you know, in our Christian world and in our homes. But you know what? It's really, really bad in New Bedford out there. In some of these places and some of these things that are going on, it's terrible. Um, there, there was two deaths in that apartment. The uh, original renter, he passed away on uh, August 31st in that apartment. And then another girl just last week passed away in that apartment from an overdose. And uh, the devil's happy. The devil's laughing while the church is sleeping. And so I was there from, uh, we had a meeting at eight, uh, 930. Uh, so from 930 to about 1130, we had a meeting. Then we had to have a moving company come in and take all the stuff out and store it. And there's procedures that have to be followed. But um, I'll tell you, it's, it's just sad. It's really sad. So anyway, um, Praise the Lord. Well, if you have your Bibles with you, open up to the book of Numbers. The book of Numbers. No, this is not going to be a lottery night. <laughs> We're not going to give you the Powerball number, <laughs> all the mega bucks. The book of Numbers, hallelujah, chapter 22. We're going to be talking tonight. Let me get my paper. I got it over here somewhere. We're going to talk about Balak, and Balak was the king of the Moabites. And when Israel came in Numbers 22, um, when he came, the Israelites were conquering another nation, and he was getting scared. So he asked for Balaam to come and to prophesy against that nation. And so uh, I want to share that with you tonight. First and foremost, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. First and foremost, I want to share with you from uh, verse twelve. Uh, let's go to verse. Um, let's go to verse uh, eleven. He says, "Behold, there is a people come out of Egypt which covereth the face of the earth. Come now, curse me them." Preadventure I shall be able to overcome them and drive them out. And God said unto Balaam, Thou shalt not go with them. I want you to really take a look at that. What was God's instruction? Do not go with them. As I was reading this, you know, there's so many times that God stops us from going to certain places. You know, when you get that uneasy feeling, you get that unpeaceful feeling in your life, and God says, 
Do not go there. Stop. Don't go. God's warning Balaam and he's telling him, don't go to that place. He says, you shall not go with them. Thou shall not curse the people for they are blessed. You cannot curse what God blesses. Israel's God's chosen people. We are God's chosen people too. But God has not forgotten Israel. And he's made it very clear that they're blessed people. And all you have to do is look at their life. They're a blessed people. They really, really are. And so here, God is instructing him and telling him, do not go there. Do not go with them and do not curse them. And verse 13 says, and Balaam rose up. I'm going to read all the way to verse 22, so. Bear with me, okay? So I'll just read it with you. And Balaam rose up in the morning, and he said unto the prince of Balak, Get you into your land, for the Lord refuses to give me leave to go with you. Now, I want you to notice something here, first and foremost, that he recognized and knew what God's will was. It's not a, to a person who didn't know. This person, Balaam, he knew what God had said. I want to tell you something. It's a lot more dangerous when God speaks to you and tells you something and you ignore it. And you know, deep in your spirit, deep in your heart, that God is saying no. And you go and do it anyway. There's a real strong consequence to pay for that. And he says, next verse. And... And the princes of Moab rose up and they went unto Balak. And they said, Balaam refuses to come with us. That's a half truth. And let me tell you something. People will try to convince you to do something that God has said not to do with half truths. Satan did it with Eve in the Garden of Eden. Gave her a half truth. And so the princes of Moab, they went down and they told Balak, they said, listen, Balaam refuses to come with us. That's not true. He was saying, the Lord has not released me to go with you. So they didn't really give a full report. Next verse, please. And Balak sent yet again princesses more and more honorable than they. So they up, he upped the ante a little bit, you know. Maybe sent some uh, lower dignitaries, but now he's sending the real big dig dignitaries to come and try to influence. Let me tell you something. When God is telling you to do or not to do something, you'll always have the opposition and you'll always have people that if you don't get their way, they'll try it another way. Amen? So he sent more honorable people than they. Next verse, please. And they came to Balaam and said to him, Thus says Balak. That's, he's not God. Sometimes men wants to be God. Thus saith Balak, the son of Zippo, Let nothing, I pray thee, hinder thee from coming unto me. Now he's, he's making a decree as a king. He's saying, no, I don't want you to stop. I want you to come here. Now see, what happens a lot of times is the devil will use scripture. The Bible says to obey the authorities. So that's why you have to know your Bible. Okay, You obey the authorities as long as it doesn't go against what God says. The moment they go against what God says is the moment you don't have to obey respectfully. Amen? 
Okay. For I will promote thee unto a very great honor. Now comes flattery. I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you a position of authority with great honor. And he says this, and I will do whatever you, you say for me to do. Come, therefore, I pray thee, and curse me this people. That is amazing. How somebody can manipulate and twist things around to get you to do things. Come on. Especially the enemy. I'm going to give you a promotion. How do you know if a promotion is from God or not? Well, pastor, I, I just got to tell you, man, I got a promotion. Man, I I'm going to be the, the senior vice president. Oh, and by the way, pastor, I can't come to church on Sundays anymore. Because part of my job is to entertain you know, the clients and stuff like that. So I have to go to the country club on Sundays. So I can't come to church anymore. Oh, and Wednesday nights, it's not going to work out for me either, you know, because Wednesday nights, you know, I, I've got all these committee meetings I've got to go to. And oh, m m Monday night's not a good night too. Uh, but if you ever switch it, let me know, you know, and I'll come. Okay. You know that's not from God. You know that's not from God. God doesn't want you to draw away from him. He wants to draw you to him. And sometimes, even what looks good, or sometimes what doesn't look so good, and I say this to pastors all the time. You know, pastors, young pastors, when they come out of Bible school, they're ripping, roaring, man. They want to go out and kill. They want to make the, you know, they want to do the, whew, they want to get out there and just rip it up. And I tell them, well, what's going on? Well, I got this church, 700 people, man. They want me to come be their pastor. I said, how old are you? 22. I said, how much experience do you have? I just graduated Bible school. What other office you got? Well, you know, I got this little church in Pennsylvania. It's only about 50 people. The pay's not that good. They're not giving me any retirement. They're not giving me a car. They're not giving me a parsonage. But that other church is. I'm getting $800 a week. And a parsonage fully paid, for, you know, all my expenses, gas, electric, everything. They're giving me a car allowance for a brand new Cadillac. They're giving me health insurance, the best, the top. And they give me a retirement fund. That's got to be God's will, right? God spoke loud enough and told them, I want you over there, they wouldn't listen. Same with Balaam. Now he's starting to get flattered. His ego is starting to get flattered. And we know that from other scriptures, which I'll get into tonight. He starts to get all, you know, puffed up. Wow, I'm really something now. Now I got a, he wants to give me a promotion and he'll, he'll do whatever I want. Imagine that, Joe the king, President Trump, he'll, he'll, he'll do anything I ask him to do. Wow, I must be important. Next verse. And Balaam answered and said unto the servants of Balak, if, ba if Balak would give me his house full of silver and gold, I cannot go beyond the word of the Lord my God to do less or more. Sounds good. Talk is cheap. How many times we heard the word of the Lord come through this church through pr prophetic utterance? Well, has Isaiah prophesied of you? You speak well of me with your lips, but your heart is far from me. Hello? Balak's a good talker. 
He lets those hear what they want to hear. No, I can't go beyond what the word of the Lord says, you know. Next verse. Now, therefore, I pray you, tarry ye also here this night, that I may know what the Lord will say unto me more. So this was a whole caravan of people. You know, the princes had gods and all that stuff, so they didn't all, they didn't all stay in his tent. They stayed in his camp. But then something happens in verse 20. And God came unto Balaam at night. You ever wonder why God comes at night? Sometimes 3 o'clock in the morning. It seems to be 3 o'clock in the morning all the time. God will wake you up. At, you look at the clock, it's 3 o'clock. He wants you to pray, or he wants you to sing, or he wants you to just talk to him, or whatever it is. But 3 o'clock, boom. God comes to Balaam at night. I don't know what time it was. It doesn't say, so I'll just say it was at night. It's a time when people's minds and hearts are quiet, most of us. Some of us, our mind never shuts down. It's like, blah, 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 some of us, our minds, we got to keep feeding our minds every second of the day. You know, people like that, God can't speak to them. You know why? They're always transmitting. You know, we get two walkie-talkies together, and one person presses the button and talks. The other one can't talk. The other one can't press the button. Why? Because one's transmitting. In order to have communication, you've got to be able to receive you can let somebody else do the transmitting. And if your mind is constantly going, always trying to be fed with information, guess what? You can't listen to God. Because you're not still. He said, be still and know that I'm God. It takes time to be still, to be quiet. So God came to Balaam at night and he said to him, if the men come to call thee, rise up and go with them. But yet the word which I shall say unto thee, that is what you shall do. Sounds pretty good, right? Let's go to the next verse. And Balaam rose up in the morning. He saddled his donkey, his ass, and he went with the princes of Moab. Next verse, please. And God's anger was kindled because he went. Wait a minute. Hold it. Time out. Is that a contradiction? God told him to go. And now, God's angry with him for going. Is that a contradiction? Why isn't it a con contradiction? What? No. Go back. Go back one scripture. He told him at night. Go back one more. And God came to Balaam at night and he said unto him, If the men come to call you, then you go. He didn't wait for them to call. He got up in the morning, saddled his ass, and he went out. He went out. He didn't wait on God. He didn't wait for the instruction. He didn't wait for the men to come to him. He went to them. So you know what that tells me? He already had his mind made up. You know, sometimes people come for counseling or they'll come and ask me a question. And they'll, I'll, they'll say, what do you think, Pastor? And I'll tell them, and they go do the, just the opposite. That tells me they already had their mind made up, just looking for somebody to agree with. And then sometimes they'll call four or five people, you know, other people, so that they can get the same answer, so they can feel comfortable about making the wrong decision. Hello? 
God told him, if, very important little word, you can circle that in your Bible, if, if the men come to call you, then you rise up and you go with them. But yet the word which I shall say unto thee, thou shalt do. So verse 21, we read it again. And Balaam rose up in the morning, saddled his ass, and went with the princes of Moab. What's that saying to you and I? That's saying, he didn't care about what God said. Come on, somebody. Anybody listening? They didn't care what God said. And God's anger was kindled because he went. And the angel of the Lord stood in the way for an adversary against him. Now, his mission, if he decided to accept it, is mission impossible. You can't curse what God's blessed. And so God says, oh, yeah? He sent an angel to stand in the way for an adversary against Balaam. I want you to know sometimes that when you're out to do something or make a decision, and sometime, not all the time, but sometime, when you come against things and things start coming against you and stuff like that, and you start binding the devil and binding demons and all kinds of stuff, that you may need to stop for a moment and ask, God, is this an angel that you sent to stop me from doing something and making a mistake? Not all the time it's the devil. I remember hearing the story of these two men. Uh, I think I heard on the radio they were giving their testimony. They said, you know, we, uh, we, got, we got, uh, went down to a certain area in their town, and they were going to... They were having an outreach ministry. And so they were, they were trying to get a hold of this building to use this building. And they said, man, I'm telling you, all hell came against us. I mean, the devil, we couldn't get favor with the, with the, uh, with the town. We couldn't get favor with the licenses and occupants' licenses. We, we couldn't get anything done. He said, there, it was like there was a brick wall that was standing in the way. He said, we fasted, we prayed, we cried out to God, we bound the devil. He says, and in one day, we were having a service, he says, and somebody spoke in tongues, and here was the interpretation. I am the Lord, and I am the one who has the wall up. They were fighting against God. God didn't want them to do that. I'm the God of the brick wall. He didn't want them to do that. This angel was sent to prevent him from doing something that God did not want him to do. Now, he was riding upon his donkey, and he had his two servants with him. Next verse, please. And the donkey saw the angel. You ever notice animals have a real keen sense about things? Like they know when a, a hurricane or an earthquake's coming, they begin to run. They have an instinct inside of them. And this donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way. And his sword was drawn in his hand. Can you imagine seeing in the spiritual realm and seeing that? I remember Sister Vicky giving a testimony about, I think somebody in Brazil, they were going to kill themselves on the train tracks and 
there was a, there, and he saw an angel actually holding back the train from going over the tracks and, and killing him. You remember that story? I could tell you a story where one time I was working at, in a shipping department in this company, and uh, we were getting ready to close. It was the end of the day, and they had garage doors. And I was standing there like this, and I was talking to the person. And uh, I said, don't forget to close the door. And my fingers were in the track of the, of the garage door. And the garage door started coming down. I literally felt someone grab my elbow and pull my hand. It was this hand. It was my playing hand. I turned around, I thought somebody was there, and there was nobody there. I said, thank you, Jesus. And this angel was there with his sword drawn. He, I mean, he meant business. There was another time there was an angel that was blocking the tree of life in the Garden of Eden. Remember, he had a, a sword that went in all directions, so nobody could get to that tree. So he had that sword in his hand, and the donkey turned his side out of the way. And went into the field. Now, if you know anything about horseback riding donkeys, and horses can do that. Remember that time we went horseback riding, that horse just took off with you? <laughs> Laid right down sideways, just like this story right here on Joe. I still remember that. Apache Ranch. And my wife, we were in uh, Cozumel, Mexico on vacation. And she was on a horse, and the horse just decided he wanted to go where he wanted to go. And pff, there goes Linda. But this donkey turned aside out of the way. And he went into the field. And Balaam, he hit that donkey to turn it back into the way. You kick him and take the whip out and give him a slap. Next verse. But the angel of the Lord stood in the path of the vineyards. A wall being on the left side and a wall being on the right side. See, the stubbornness of man, when they don't get it, when God is trying to tell them something, trying to stop you from making a mistake. So now the angel of the Lord moves. They're going in another direction, thinking they're going to go around this, 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 this donkey's going to go around. So the donkey starts going. What happens? Keep going. Next verse. And when a donkey saw the angel of the Lord, here comes the donkey. Sees the angel of the Lord, leans up against the wall, crushes Balaam's foot against the wall. Now he's getting mad. Ever get mad when things ain't going right? Circumstances, situations are stopping you. It's not always the devil. And so he hit the donkey, you know, smote that donkey again. Give him another whack. I remember one time I was riding a horse and uh, I was at a full gallop. And that horse just decided to put out his front legs and stop. And I went head over the horse, but I was able to grab the bridle. And I grabbed that bridle, and I landed on my feet, and I took my hand, I smacked that horse in the head, and he just turned around and boom, right back in the barn. You've got to tell him who's boss. He hit that donkey again. It gets a little more interesting, you know. Okay, next verse. And the angel of the Lord went further and stood in the narrow place. Now, there was only one other place left. Where there was no way to turn either to the right or to the left. Ever been in a situation like that? You don't know which way to turn. But we're so bullheaded sometimes, we're going to just go ahead and plow, try to plow right through, right through that thing. Right through that narrow spot. Well, I'm going to get there if it kills me. 
And when he saw, and when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she fell down on the Balaam. <laughs> donkey just laid down. I mean, come on, sometimes we need to get the hint. And Balaam's anger was really ripping now. And he smote that donkey with a staff. And the Lord opened the mouth of the donkey. And she said unto Balaam, you think Francis the talking mule was the first one? Mm -mm. You think Mr. Ed was the first one? Mm -mm. It's in the Bible. And the donkey starts talking to him. My Lord. I, I want you to imagine for a moment. Here's a street, narrow as it is. Now the donkey laying down. Here's this guy beating his donkey. People walking by. Now, I don't know if the people could hear the donkey talk. You know, it was like Mr. Ed, you know, only, only the owner could hear him talk. The other people never heard him talk. He always clammed up, always shut up. But just think, here's this man now. He's beating his donkey. And now the donkey turns to him and says, what have I done unto you that you hit me these three times? I didn't know the donkey knew math. Now the donkey's using reason. Why have you hit me these three times? Now today, we would put them on psychological medication. We would do some kind of psychosis on this person. Because the next verse says, And Balaam said to the donkey, now he's talking to a donkey. Because you mocked me. <laughs> a donkey? How's a donkey going to mock him? I would there were a sword in my hand, for now I would have killed you. Wow. He's angry. He's angry. But he's not realizing something. You're going to see it in a moment. He didn't realize something was taking place. Next verse. And the donkey said to Balaam, Am not I, am not I thy, don't I belong, and I your donkey, upon, upon which you have ridden ever since I was thine unto this day? Was I ever want to not do so unto you? Put that in the NLT for me so I can read that in English. But I'm the same donkey you have ridden all your life. The donkey's talking to him. Have I ever done anything like this before? And Balaam says, no. No, you haven't. You've never done anything like that before. Next verse. Then... The Lord opened Balaam's eyes. Wait a minute. He wasn't going around with his eyes closed, beating a donkey, talking to a donkey. His physical eyes were open, but his spiritual eyes were closed. I want you to understand that a lot of times you're not going to understand in the natural what God is trying to tell you in the spiritual. 
And you and I, we need to have our spiritual eyes open. And the Lord, you know, it's like sometimes you, you know, you tell somebody something, you tell them and 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 they don't get it. And then all of a sudden they're somewhere and somebody comes up to them and says it one time and boom, they get it. It's not because of that person. It's because that's the moment and the time that God opened up their eyes. How many, told, how many people told you about Jesus? How many people came and told you something? And all of a sudden, one day somebody comes and says one thing, and all of a sudden, boom, your eyes get open. Wow. It says, and the Lord opened Balaam's eyes. And what did he see? Was he impressed with a talking donkey? No. What he saw was the angel of the Lord standing in the roadway with a drawn sword in his hand. And Balaam bowed his head, fell face down on the ground before him. Wow. Wow. In verse 32, and the angel of the Lord said unto him, Wherefore hast thou smitten thy donkey these three times? Why did you hit that donkey three times? Behold, I went out to withstand thee, because thy way is perverse before me. You're not listening to me. Let me ask you a question tonight. Who's your donkey? Who's your donkey? Does God have to go to that extreme to stop you from doing something that you make a mistake that could cost you your life? I believe that if Balaam would have gone forward and that angel would have hit him with that sword, he'd be dead. Do you know that the Israelites, when they were in trouble, and the Bible says that when God spoke to them and told them, the battle's not yours, it's mine, and they just stood there, and they praised the Lord with the Ark of the Covenant, God fought the battles, and they, and they lost. The enemy was defeated. He does it with the angels. You know that God can dispense an angel? I believe that. He can dispense an angel on your behalf. I believe that time that witch put that curse on me and I, I prayed that prayer. I said, Lord, if he's never going to repent, never come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, I pray that God, what he wants to happen to me, let it happen to him. Trying to give me a heart attack, and guess what? Two weeks later, on a Sunday morning, the same time I felt the pain, is he died of a heart attack, 41 years old. God sent that angel and took that sword and said, enough. Wham. Come on, somebody. God will send an angel to fight your battle. Are you going to ask God for help? The Bible says, one of my favorite psalms, Psalm 121. I will look to the hills from whence cometh forth my help. My help cometh in the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. My help comes in the name of the Lord. He is my refuge. He is my strength. He is my rock of defense. Hallelujah. And all you got to know is that he'll, he'll hold you in the hollow of his hand. Hallelujah. And protect you. Come on, somebody. You just got to believe he will. If you hold your peace, then the Lord will fight your battle. Victory is yours. Victory is mine. Victory is mine. I told Satan.
to get thee behind. Oh, victory, today it is mine. Well, let me ask you a question. What's your donkey? You need to go that far for God to put something like that in your life? Your stubborn spirit, you won't listen? Can I tell you something? God loves you enough not to let you continue on the way you are. And he'll allow things to happen to you and to me if we will not cooperate because he loves us and he, he, wants, us, he wants the best for us. And he doesn't do it to be mean and cruel. He does it to bring correction and instruction. For whom the Lord loves, he corrects. You can go on in your little stubborn little donkey, you, you know, fighting, kicking, and biting and scratching all you want to. But God's going to have his way. Amen? Or if you continue down the road you're going, you're going to meet that angel with a sword. And it's going to be lights out for you. Come on, somebody. He said, I went out. I went out to withstand thee. The angel that went out was a theophany. God was in that angel executing his judgment. It's like a Christophany. When you have uh, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego in the fire, and I see a fourth man in there like the Son of Man, that was a, that was a, that was a Christophany. That was Christ. That was the word before he came flesh and dwelt among us. Ooh, come on, somebody. Hallelujah. Next verse. I want you to look at this because Sometimes people think this God that we serve is just some mushy, loving, huggy, huggy, wuggy, buggy, boogie. And he said, and the donkey saw me and turned from me these three times. That's showing God's mercy. God could have got him on the first try. But God's mercy was extended. Three times God's been calling and, and calling and calling and you won't answer. He said, unless she had turned from me, surely now also I had slain thee and saved her alive. Woo. <clears throat> God will tell you, don't go to that nightclub. Don't go there. I can tell you a story that I know for truth. I had a friend named Ed Aruda, And he used to get gas out of this gas station. There was a young man that worked there. And the young man really didn't have too many friends. You know, he was kind of a geeky kind of guy, and he didn't have too many friends. But Brother Ed kind of took an interest in this young man. So the young man, they would talk. You know, every time he stopped for gas, he would talk with him and stuff. And he asked the young man, he said, what was one of your dreams? What would you like to do? He says, oh, man, he said, you know what I would like to do? He said, but I know I can't afford it. I can't ever go. He said, I'd love to go to New York City. So Brother Ed said, you know what? Let me pray about it. So he prayed about it. He went back for gas one day. And he said to the young man, you know what? The Lord wants me to take you to New York. He says, when? He says, he said, probably in a couple of weeks, two or three weeks, he said, Okay. So in the meantime, Ed is praying, you know, praying. So he gets a list of five places they're going to go. So they get to New York. I'm on the bus, and they go on the bus. They go up to New York, and the kid's all excited, man. He's in a big city, you know. He's seeing all kinds of things, you know. And so they're walking by the Empire State Building. And he goes, Brother Ed, he said, Ed look. The Empire State Building. He said, oh, man, I always want to go to the top of the Empire State Building. Can we go to the Empire State Building and go to the top? Ed said, wait a minute. Because Ed was a prayer. 
And he prayed and asked the Lord where he wanted him to go. He looked at the list and said, it's not on the list. Oh, but Ed, man, it's right here. It's right here. All we got to do is go in the door, go up the elevator. It's right here. He said, it's not on the list. He said, don't you, don't you understand? I pray about these things, and God told me where to go. He said, now, see, you and I would probably fight that. Oh, man, we're trying to be super spiritual. You can't take the kid up there. You're right there in front of the Empire State Building. You can't just take him up there. You've got to come up uh, with the super spiritual stuff. This was 5 o'clock in the afternoon. I believe it was 5.05 or 5.10. There was a guy up on the top of the Empire State Building who shot three people. And Ed and that kid would have been up there. Hello? Sometimes God is protecting you. And if he says no, don't go, then don't go. He said, look, I would have, if that donkey didn't turn aside, turn aside, he said, I would have killed you right there on the spot. Wow. Wow. Now here comes the good part. Verse 34. Are you enjoying this? And Balaam said to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned. Can I tell you, it wasn't just about, it wasn't just about not listening to the Lord. Do me a favor, put up Jude, the book of Jude one eleven, Jude, J-U-D-E, Jude one eleven. He says, woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the era of Balaam for reward. And perished in the gainsaying of Korah. That's in the New Testament. And he's given an example of what Balaam did. Remember what he says? Oh, bring more princesses, more honorable, and tell them we're going to give you a higher position, and the king's going to do whatever you want him to do. And he ran greedily after the era of Balaam. That's how we know why he didn't wait for the people to come to him. He had a greedy heart. Look at um, 2 Peter 2.15. Which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray following the way of Balaam, the son of Bosa, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. He wanted to have fun. He wanted to have fun. I told you the story when I was seven years old. I lived in Holly Street. A bunch of kids got together. We started playing. And we went up some, we got up to County Street there where that little white church on the corner is. And right where those factories were was U.S. furniture. And behind it, there was a little quarry, and it was filled with water. And uh, a bunch of kids were back there, and they were swimming in it and stuff like that, you know. And, and uh, this one kid that I was with, he says, come on, Bob. He said, we made a raft. They made it out of um, uh, pallets. He said, come on, Bob. We, we made a little raft. We're going to go on the raft. So I went to go down, and something stopped me and said, don't go. As, I, as I'm talking to you right now, that's the voice I heard said, do not go. I believe that was an angel of the Lord that stopped me. I didn't go. That kid went. They went on the raft. Him and his brother went on the raft. The raft sank. That boy that told me, let's go, he came up. His brother didn't. 
he frantically dived two or three times trying to get to his brother, and he couldn't. He came out of the water. Me and him ran to a house, banging on the door. Please call the fire. Please call, call the police. My brother, he's drowning. He's drowning. He's drowning. And I remember the fire trucks coming, and they pulled his body out with a rake, and he died. Could have been me. Could have been me. Another time, I was backslidden away from God. I was in Pennsylvania. I was on the turnpike. Just come from an Irish bar, had a few drinks in me, and I'm going down the highway, going home. A voice told me, I was in high speed lane, said, get over in the other lane. I no sooner got over on the other lane, went around the bend, there was a car coming the wrong way on the highway, on my lane. You can't curse what God's blessed. God knew where I'd be today, even back then. And all we got to do is trust him. Who's your donkey? Who does God have to use? He'll use a pastor. He'll use a friend. He'll use a co-worker. He'll use some. he even use unsaved people. God can use whoever he wants to. If he can use a donkey and make that donkey talk, don't be going looking for animals to talk to you now. Okay, this ain't Dr. Doolittle or whatever that guy's name is. Okay, don't go looking for that. But can I tell you that we have somebody more important. We have somebody more gentle, more kind, known as the Holy Spirit. Who, if you listen, if you listen, if you listen, and don't always take it as the person is talking to you, but God may be speaking through that person to you. Amen. And Balaam, go back to that other scripture in Numbers. The last one we had, verse 34, 22, 34. Balaam said to the angel, I have sinned. He is now on the road to restoration, but it's going to take you to acknowledge where you have fallen. It's going to take you to acknowledge what you need to do to make things right. For I knew not, listen to that, for I knew not that thou stood in the way against me. I didn't know, God, that it was you. Can I tell you, we're living in a time. We're living in a time where someone will tell you they're a Christian. But they swear like truck drivers. They can be in an unholy relationship and think they're Christians. My question would have been, oh, you're a Christian, but are you born again? Because you can be a Christian through a denominational affiliation. See, Catholics think they're Christians because of their affiliation with Catholicism. But are you born again? And that's the question. Are you born again? You can be a Christian through denominational affiliation and not know God. But Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Those are gifts. Didn't we heal the sick? Didn't we, didn't we, you know, do all these wonderful works? What did Jesus say? Depart from me. I never knew you. Just like the lukewarm church. They were rich. They had need of nothing. They had all the programs. They had everything going for them. They were rich. They didn't have need for nothing. 
They really thought they were spiritual because of their growth and because of their position. They had money. They were able to do whatever they wanted to do. But that's how man judges according to the outward appearance. But God looks at the heart, and he looks at the inward thing, and he says, but the Lord sees you as wretched, poor, miserable, blind, and naked. He says, I, try, I, I dare you to buy of me gold tried in the fire. You will never become what God wants you to become unless you're willing to be put in the fire. He will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and... The fire is a purging. The fire is a cleansing to get out all of the dross. Bob and I worked at a place in Pawtucket. We worked with a silver hot pots that were, what about, 700 degrees, 800 degrees, higher or higher. Metal would burn in there. They'd throw metal in there, and then all, the, all of the, the impurities would come to the top. They skimmed that off. I worked in a gold factory, the same thing. They'd put the gold in. They would put it at a high, high temperature, and all the impurities of the gold would come to the top, and they'd skim all the impurities off of the top. Can I tell you, that's what God does to us. He puts us through the fire. He, he puts us through the tests. But you got to listen. you got to listen for his voice and know that when God is speaking to you and he's tugging at your spirit, you know it. Balaam said, I've sinned, man. He says, but I knew not that you stood in the way against me. He said, now, therefore, if it, disple if it displeased thee, I will get me back again. God, give me another chance. Let me get back to that place. Let's get back to that place. Monday nights, let's get back to that place where we're desiring of you. Mama said something to me. It was sister that comes. She says something to me Monday night. She says, Pastor, she says, when I come here, she says, I have such a strong desire for more of Jesus than I've ever had before. She says, I don't know what it is. She says, I've never met anybody like you. She says, I've been to a lot of churches. She says, but there's something here. God is doing something here, and don't miss it. Oh, it bothers me when people don't come because they're missing out on what God wants to do in them. Because the attitude is, well, it's just a prayer meeting. No, God's doing something. And you need to share it with people. When you get on Facebook, you need to share it. Tell people, man, God's doing something on Monday nights. Come. We don't want to just get blessed here. We want to bless other churches. This, this couple, we're not asking them to come be a part of our church. But they're taking something back with them. And people are noticing and saying, man, where did you get that? Come on. And I told her, I said, can I, so I said, sister, let me tell you something. It's not our church. It's not me. It has nothing to do with me. It's a divine sovereign move of God. It's a divine sovereign move of God. I give him all the glory, all the praise, all the honor. God is doing something. Joe came to me the, the, that uh, Monday night. He said, Bobby says, God's been manifesting himself to me. Things have been happening where I've been noticing his presence like the day of the ordination that you had. I said, he's calling you, Joe, to a deeper walk. He's calling you to deep, deep calleth unto deep, the Bible says. Come on. Deep calleth unto deep. If we're willing to pay the price, we'll get the reward. Amen? It's like a man, the Bible says, when he's looking for that treasure and he goes and he digs deep for that treasure. But you've got to work at it. It's not going to just come to you. It's not going to fall in your lap. You've got to be willing. 
Balaam would have lost out with God if he would have been persisting in his own way, in his stubbornness and his rebelliousness, he would have lost his life. But then he says, I've sinned against you, God. And now I know that, you know, that I didn't know you were standing in my way, but now I know. <coughs> he probably was over there kissing that donkey, making up with that donkey. I'm sorry, donkey. I didn't know you saved my life. You saved my life. Think about that. Just think if it wasn't for that person in your life, you'd be lost on your way to hell. Your life all messed up. If it wasn't for Pentecostal fire, Pastor Tom, where would you be? If it wasn't for your dad coming to the ministry, where would you be? I don't forget those things. I remember those things. God brings them back to remembrance to encourage me when I go through the difficult times. Does this help anybody tonight? Who's your donkey? <laughs> Don't be whacking and beating your donkey. Maybe your donkey's trying to tell you something. He's trying to save you from more heartache and more pain. Amen? Let's just pray. Father, thank you. Now, we have a lesson here tonight about Balaam and not having the discernment that Christians need today. God. I pray, God, that you give us that spirit of discernment in a greater way. I know we have it, but, God, in a greater way that we'll be able to discern, Father, when you say no, when you say stop, when you say go, when you say left, or you say right, or when you say this is the way, walk ye in it. Lord, give us a cooperating spirit. And we thank you and we praise you.